You're all very welcome to our morning service. Thank you so much for coming. We trust the Lord will bless us today, meet with us, and uh, give us a special touch in our own souls from themselves. And the first uh, piece we're going to sing this morning in the morning worship is praise to the Lord, uh, the Almighty, the King of creation, O oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. Stand and sing this lovely hymn together. Father, we come with praise in our hearts this morning, and Lord, with thanks and gratitude for what you mean to us. <clears throat> we pray that you will speak to this congregation today, dear Father. I pray as the word of God is opened and as Danny opens what you have laid upon his heart, that you will give us receptive hearts. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us obedient hearts. We thank you for the privilege that we have today of the open Bible. Many countries today, the Bible is closed and not allowed to be distributed, but Lord, today here, we have the Word of God. And we pray throughout our land, throughout our world today, that you bless each one that has gone to administer your Word into countries that have never heard. And we pray, Lord, that they will get the vision, Lord, of perishing souls who need a saviour. 
thank you for what you're doing for us here. We thank you, Lord, even for meeting uh, with the young people this morning at Sunday school. Um, and Lord, for the word uh, to their hearts. And we pray for our children growing up today. We pray for every mother and father in this congregation this morning. Lord, that you would help them to be praying parents, to be parents that not only love the Lord, but instill it into their children. And that, Lord, that we would pray for their families as they grow in a world that is very anti-God. But, Lord, in the midst of that, you promise to keep them and to rear their families for God and in the Word of God. And we pray that, Lord, as a fellowship and as a family of God, we will pray one for another. We do remember uh, Pastor Sandra this morning over there in Cookstown. Uh, Lord, as uh, he has had to stand in there for his dad. But I pray that you will bless him at short notice, and I pray that you will help him with the word that you've laid in his heart over at Cookstown. We pray for Danny here this morning. We pray, Lord, for the word you've laid upon his heart as well for this congregation. I pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit may take it and apply it to all our hearts. We pray for this congregation. We pray for those uh, who are sick still. Uh, we do remember uh, David and Emma Cranston and the little baby Rose. We thank you how you are keeping your hand upon it. And I pray, Lord, that they will know uh, the blessing of God upon them today as a family, uh, keeping them. We remember others like Gwen Crooks, Lord, and uh, Trevor Smyton, uh, people that are in great need. Uh, and we pray for the elderly of our congregation. Many of them that can't get out, Lord, but as they're at home this morning, maybe throughout the week they're listening and listening to CD. I pray that you'll bless them in their homes. And thank you for many of their lives that have lived it for thee. And today, Lord, they're uh, homebound, but we thank you that God still meets with them every day. And we just ask you that you will meet with us today. We hand the meeting over to thee. We pray, Lord, you bless all that have been bereaved. Continue to remember uh, the Redmond and Jackson family and all their family circle. Continue to remember others who have left lost loved ones over the years. Uh, that empty chair is still there, but we remember them today, that God will bless them. So cover us with the blood today, and may this be a good morning in your presence. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Can we sing together a couple of pieces seated? Um, our first one here is What Love Could Remember. It's a lovely, lovely piece. No wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, the count's not their sum. Thrown into the sea with thy bottom or shore, our sins they are many. His mercy is more. Great peace. Let's sing it together. Thank you, Rachel. <coughs>
His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We'd soon meet a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. As we are gathered, Jesus is here, one with each other. Jesus is here. It's great to know that Jesus is here, right in our midst this morning, in this sanctuary. As we are gathered, let's sing this lovely piece together. We give you a special welcome, and we trust that the Lord will really bless you together. We give a special welcome to our brother Danny, uh, Danny Brooks, uh, who's with us, no stranger, but uh, we're glad to have him, and we trust the Lord will bless his ministry to our hearts today. Do you remember our pre-service pre prayer meeting tonight at 6 p.m. here in the side room, and tonight our evening service at 6.30 p.m. We're singing, will be our sister Lynn McNeese. So do remember Lynn on that regard, please. Um, tonight at the evening service, Danny and Philippa will be giving prayer requests um, as they return to the Philippines, uh, God willing, this Friday. So um, do remember that this evening as well in the evening service. Pastor Samuel will be here this evening and he'll be giving uh, the Lord's word. Immediately after the evening service this evening, there will be a short time of prayer in the back hall for the upcoming mission there in Kiliman. So if you can stay for about half an hour or so uh, after the evening service in our back hall, we'd really appreciate uh, time spent with God. Do you remember on Tuesday morning there will be no footsteps, which is off for two weeks, owing to the Easter holidays. Um, so there will be a special time of prayer for the upcoming mission on Zoom on Tuesday morning at 10.30 a.m. That's this Tuesday morning, 10.30 a.m. on Zoom. Bible study and prayer meeting, 8 p.m. Uh, this uh, Wednesday evening. And the speaker of the prayer meeting will be the Reverend Maxwell. So do remember to come to that, please, on Wednesday evening. There will be a short extended time of prayer on Wednesday night as well, after the uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting again for the mission there in Kiliman. Uh, then on next Sunday there will be no Sunday school or Bible class owing to Easter holidays, however it will be restored the following Sunday after Easter. Easter Sunday morning service next Sunday will be 11.30 a.m. and there will be communion um, after that morning service. If you remember that please, 
and then a pre-service prayer meeting an evening at 6 o'clock and the Easter Sunday evening service at 6.30 uh, and the singing of that will be Victoria Salt. Um, those that are taking part in the church choir, uh, if they could wait uh, after next Sunday evening service for a brief time just to go over some of the pieces that they'll be singing, uh, I think for during the mission and so forth. Uh, so if you could wait next Sunday evening for a brief time for that. <coughs> Reverend Max, sorry, the Reverend Patterson, Pastor Sammy will be speaking at both services next Sunday. Uh, the offering today, um, as it's down here, will be for Danny and Philippa on both services, and everything other than the blue envelope will be going towards their ministry there in the Philippines as they return on Friday. Youth camp is now full, uh, we're glad to say. Uh, the junior camp has seven spaces left, so get your form in quickly if your child intends to go. Ladies early, this year the ladies early will be on the 20th of May, going to Hillsborough Castle, shopping and then dinner, uh, £40 per person. If you intend to go, please sign up and the sheet in the hallway, table as soon as possible. The, the, the quest early forms need to be returned to Helen next Sunday to secure a place. If you haven't got that form, see Helen Marshall, please, after the service. These are all the announcements, and they're all obviously in the will of God. So we'll sing another hymn together, and then Danny. Uh, will bring the Lord's word to us this morning. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here.
trust that uh, you're having a, a lovely uh, Lord's Day. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was sharing in a Sunday evening service, and afterwards, my son asked me if I was okay. And I said, yes, Judah, I'm fine, thank you. And I said, why? And he said, because you looked angry. <laughs> and so, I promise I'm not, and, and I promise I'm going to do everything in my power to not look angry. Um, but it is, at the same time, a privilege to come into the Word of God and to see what God's Word has for us and allow, not the speaker, but allow the Spirit to then take that Word and see what God wants to do in our hearts. And so that is my prayer this morning, that, that uh, we would listen to the Word of the Lord and say, okay, God, what do you have for me? Um, a passage that I'm going to be reading from this morning, I find that I'm getting older, so I'm going to need glasses here. A passage I'm going to be reading from this morning is 2 Timothy 2, verses 15 through 22. 2 Timothy 2, verses 15 through 22. The Apostle Paul starts off in verse 15 and says... Study to show thyselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet to the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let's go before the Lord. Dear Jesus, we come before you this morning, and we praise you, and we honor you that you have even allowed us to come into your presence. We thank you that when we were sinners, that when we were separated from you, that while we were enemies of you because of our sin, you pursued us in love and you went straight to the cross and you bore the punishment for my sins, for our sins. And in return, you gave us your righteousness, that you have made us holy in your sight, not because we are, but because you have given us your holiness and God sees you in us. And so this morning we come before you and we come into your word and God, we desire to know what you have for us so that we can live in light of the truth that you say about us. So God, we just bring this before in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So I don't know if any of you have ever thought to yourself, I wish I was something different than what I am. Maybe as you go into the Word of God and you read stories about people in the Old Testament or the New Testament, there's this little bit of angst where I wish I was something different. I wish I was like Moses, that I could be a strong leader. Maybe I wish I was like the Apostle Paul who could get up and who could teach and preach the gospel with clarity and people would come to the Lord and churches were established. Maybe you wish you were like Stephen. You wish that God would give you opportunities to stand in front of influential people and with boldness to the very end preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter the cost. Maybe some of you are like me as I look back at my early life. I look back at myself and I saw weakness. I saw failure. I felt disappointment from the Lord. And so oftentimes as a younger believer, my prayers were, God, make me into something different. I don't want to be me. I don't want to struggle. I don't want to keep failing. Can you make me a mature believer? Can you make me into somebody 
who would honor you. I just desired to be something other than I was. And as I looked at myself, I knew I didn't have the ability to do that. Today I want to look at some verses that the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. And he's writing to Timothy and to us today as we sit here in the church about how to become useful to the Lord. And I feel like for those of us who are believers, this is something that rings true in our hearts, that in the deepest core of who we are, we would love to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and have him look at us and say, you are useful to me. You are ready to be used. You bring honor to my name. But then if you're anything like me, there's that question in my heart, well, how? Yes, I want that, Lord, but how? And that's what the Apostle Paul is going to lay out for us in this passage. And he starts off in verse 20. And he says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And he starts off by talking about this great house. And this great house is a metaphor. It's an analogy for the church of Jesus Christ. I don't think he was specifically referring to the church of Ephesus. I think he's talking about the broader church, the international church. Each of those gathered together who would consider themselves to be followers of Jesus Christ through faith in him and his death on the cross. And he's saying that in this great house, in the church of Jesus Christ, there are two types of vessels. Right? Now, now in, our, in our own minds, sometimes we, we don't like extremes. Like we, we like to kind of be in the middle. The Apostle Paul says there's vessels made of gold and silver, vessels unto honor, and there's vessels made of earth and wood, vessels unto dishonor. And there's a part of us that might like, hey, is there something in the middle? <laughs> Do I have to necessarily be that or this? Can I not just be a middle vessel? It's not so bad, but I can kind of live the life that I want. Paul says there's two vessels here. Verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And so we've got these two vessels, the one of gold and silver. This is going to be the vessel that is made of precious materials. This is going to be the vessel that as you go into a rich and a wealthy house, possibly a castle, think of something exorbitant that the master of that house is going to put these on display. He's going to be proud of these vessels. He's going to want people to see these vessels and realize that those vessels reflect on his power, on his wealth, on his magnificence. And then there's other vessels in the house. And these are vessels of wood and clay. These vessels are made of common materials. These vessels are not the type of vessels you would put on display. These vessels are not the things that you would want guests to look at. They're kind of hidden in the back room. They're vessels of dishonor. And so as we come into verse 21, he begins the statement like this. If a man therefore purge himself of these. And what he's referencing in the purging are those vessels of dishonor, those things that are dishonorable, the life that sometimes believers live that is dishonoring to the Lord. If we purge ourselves of those things, he will be a vessel unto honor sanctified. So what the Apostle Paul is, is wanting to do is he's wanting to let us know that as we talk about living a life that's going to honor the Lord, wanting to be useful to the Lord, he's about to tell us what that process is, how we can go about living a life this way, right? Answering that question that many of us have, God, how can I serve you? How can I please you? How can I live a life that honors you? But before we get into talking about the how, Paul is doing something in this passage that I want to kind of slow down and I want to take some time to look at 
so that when we read over certain words and certain phrases and certain things taking place in a passage, we don't just blow over it and kind of go on to something else without clearly understanding. So in this passage, the Apostle Paul, he's contrasting two things. He's talk, contrasting vessels of gold and silver with vessels made of earth and wood. He's contrasting vessels that are made unto honor and vessels that are for dishonor. And then he says this, if you purge yourself of these, you're going to be a vessel of honor. He says, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. So he's bringing in the word sanctified. And the whole time, this word sanctified is actually at the core of this contrast here. Those who are vessels of honor are sanctified. They're living in a sanctified way. Those who are not are living in a common way. Okay, and so as we read through this, there might not be too much jumping out at us. At least that was the case for me growing up. And so just so we're on the same page, when we talk about sanctified, when we go into the New Testament, the Greek word that means sanctified is also translated as holy. It means the exact same thing. Same Greek word, sometimes translated sanctified, sometimes translated holy. The only difference is the translators sometimes were influenced or went with the, the Latin root, which is sanctus, and sometimes the translator went with the English, Old English, which was holy. That's it. So when we see sanctify, we can think holy, same thing. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, if somebody were to ask me, what do you think the word holy means? Well, in the States and from kind of our Western um, culture, and, and, and we're very much into right and wrong and the judici judicial system, um, for me, holy, if I was going to describe it, would have been something that's right it's pure, it's perfect, kind of this idea of moral perfection, right? And then we even come up with words like, or phrases like, oh, you're holier than thou, right? If somebody accuses you of being holier than thou, it means that you think you're better than everyone else. You think you're pur pure, pure, and I'm not, right? So in my mind, it kind of carried that idea of, of purity, perfection. And there is a measure of that there, but that's not the bulk of the meaning. When I went to Bible school, then they said, well, actually, that means um, to be set apart. Okay, and so as a young man, hearing that now holiness means to be set apart, that still didn't really ring too deeply with meaning in my heart. It's like there's this glass, and now it's over there. What I want to do is spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament Going back into the tabernacle as God is setting it up and allowing some of these passages to bring out meaning to us of when God uses the phrase holy, when the Apostle Paul uses the phrase holy, that we know exactly what he's talking about. We know exactly what the implications are. So I'm going to be reading through some passages. Feel free to read along with me or you can just listen along. So I'm going to be going to Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. Starts off like this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. And thou shalt bring in the table, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick, and light the lamps thereof. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for, for the incense before the ark of the testimony, and put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle. And thou shalt set the altar, the burnt offering, before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt set the labor between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and shalt put water therein. And thou shalt set up the court round about, and hang up the hanging at the court gate. Okay, so what he's kind of doing in the previous chapters, 
He's let us know, look, this is the different articles. These are the different vessels that I want to be made for my tabernacle. And he's gone through and given very specific instructions on how to make each of these pieces. Now he's telling Moses and Israel, now this is exactly where I want every single one of these pieces to be placed in my tabernacle. Verses 9 and 10. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein and shalt hollow it and all the vessels thereof and it shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all his vessels and sanctify the altar and it shall be an altar most holy. So here basically is a process simplified that the Lord is basically saying, okay, here's all this stuff that I told you how to make, what to make it with, how big it was going to be. And then I'm telling you where to put it. And now I'm telling you to bring it through this process of consecration, which is another holy word. And you're going to anoint it to make it mine. And only after it's anointed will I consider it mine and it will be holy. So he's basically saying that holy means belonging to him, only used for his purposes, only his way. Right? That there's no room for creativity here. There's no room for Aaron the priest to say, well, hey, can we tweak this a little bit? God's saying, my stuff, my directions, put it in the place I tell you to put it, anoint it and consecrate it the way I tell you to put it, and only then will I consider it to be mine. He's basically saying that if you want to interact with me, if you want to please me, if you as the priest want to come into my presence, there's one way to do it. And it's going to be my way. All right, so let's move on and look at some of the specifics of some of these. Exodus chapter 30, verse 1 says this, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood shalt thou make it. So now he's talking about the altar of incense. And he's saying, you're going to make it of this particular type of wood. And then the next verses, he goes on and he talks about how big he wants it to be, the exact length. It's going to be overlaid in gold, extremely particular about how this altar of incense is going to be made. And then in verses 9 and 10, it says this. He says, you shall offer no strange incense thereof, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall you make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. So most holy unto the Lord basically means that this is my altar. This is going to be used for my purposes. And when you come in to my presence, you are going to use my stuff exactly the way that I deem proper. And only then will this bring worship and honor to me. So part of holy has to do with it doesn't belong to anyone else. You don't use my stuff or anything else. That's the incense altar. Let's read what he says about the incense itself. Verses 34 through 38, he says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stacked ancha and galbanum, these sweet spices with the pure frankincense of each shall be there like a weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And be unto you most holy does not mean that this is going to be your recipe. What it means is this recipe is off limits. Nobody gets to use my recipe. 
He then says in verse 37 and 38, And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a part of me where my reaction is, doesn't this seem a little bit extreme? Where God is saying, look, this incense is to be used for me and only me. This recipe, I'm not sharing with anyone else. If you think your wife would like to smell this recipe and you as a priest take this home and you burn it in your house, you're done. You're cut off. You are no longer a member of the nation of Israel. And there's a part that seems like that's kind of extreme. But that is the point. God is the creator of the universe, the one who spoke all things into existence is extreme. He is extremely other. He is extremely different. He is extremely holy. He is so extreme that under no circumstances can any of us ever fathom or wrap our minds around who he is. And so if we ever if a priest would ever have any hope of being able to walk into the very presence of God, he's going to have to come to God God's way. He's going to have to use God's stuff in the way that God requires. He doesn't just get to use God's stuff for whatever he wants. So if a priest is going to come in and he's going to use God's tabernacle and God's altar for incense and the recipe that God has prescribed, how does a priest who is a normal person like you and I become holy and actually enter into the presence of God without being struck dead? The idea of being common is everything that is not holy. The opposite of holy is common. So when the priest wakes up in the morning, he's in his common house, he puts on his common clothes, he eats his common food, he walks through the common street up to the tabernacle or temple, he walks in and he has to become something other than common in order to enter the presence of the Lord. And so this is what the Lord does. In chapter 28, verses 2 and 3, he says this, and thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, if you continue to read through the chapter, it's going to go on with the exact same measure of details for everything else. God is talking about different articles of clothing, how he wants them made, what he wants them to look like, what materials he wants them to look like. And a priest has to put these on exactly the way that God says. All the way down to in verses 42 through 43, he even talks about holy undergarments. Right? Even the underwear the priest wears has to be exactly down to what God is saying because every single thing that touches the priest's body has to be holy in order for him to enter into the presence of God. And this is serious stuff. That's why later on in the chapter, you have to put bells around the hem of the garment because if a priest brings anything common into the presence of God, if a priest uses anything that belongs to God in a way that God has not deemed proper, there's a very high likelihood he's going to be struck dead. And when those bells stop ringing, the other priests know to drag him out. There's no messing around with God's holiness. And that's what we are starting to get from this passage all the way down to in verse 36. It talks about this plate of gold that's put on the forehead of the priest and it says holiness to the Lord. That this priest has to put everything on exactly as the Lord details in order to come into his presence and be able to worship him, to be able to honor him. God takes his holiness very seriously. So this holy common concept that was originated in the Old Testament 
is brought forward into the New Testament. And the Christian faith that was birthed in the first century did not prescribe the keeping of the Levitical system. In other words, they didn't teach that you and I as believers have to wear priestly garments in order to please God and make him happy. Right? They didn't bring that forward. Right? Jesus' death on the cross, his sacrifice was the thing that makes God happy. And when we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, that now God is happy and pleased with us because we are in Christ. Okay, so that changed. But what was brought forward is this holy common concept that along with being a believer in Jesus Christ, someone who has been made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, somebody who is now called holy because of Jesus Christ, there is a lifestyle that goes with that. It's not clothes. It's a life. Now, in the Old Testament, thinking about that which is common, right, you, you could do whatever you wanted outside the tabernacle. If you wanted to build an altar for incense in your house, you build one. Right? You can use whatever wood you wanted. You can make it whatever size you wanted. You could burn any type of incense on it you wanted because that was common. It didn't matter. You wear whatever clothes you want to wear. You eat whatever you want to eat. All of that doesn't matter because it's common. But don't you dare bring that which is common into the holy presence of God. Right? We see that with Nadab and Abihu. They knew exactly what God desired. They knew exactly what God required. And they thought, well, maybe he'll appreciate some creativity and maybe I can improve on it. And they offered strange fire before the Lord and he struck them dead. You do not bring that which is common into the holy presence of God. So here's, here's what some of the imagery means for us. That when you and I have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, there is an incredible change that takes place. You and I go from being enemies with God, separated from God, lost eternally in our sin, and he takes us and he makes us his. But part of him making us his, part of the reason that we are told we could walk boldly before the throne of God that we can talk to him any time, that we can have fellowship with him. The reason we can do that is because he has made us holy. We are told that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, that the very presence of God that once dwelt in the tabernacle now dwells in every single one of us. And unlike the priest who can walk out of the common into the tabernacle, worship the Lord, and walk back out of the tabernacle back into the common, you and I never get to leave the tabernacle. God has saved us and made us holy. And what he wants us to know is how we live as holy children of God as the temples of the Holy Spirit, as the ones who have the very Spirit of God dwelling in us is how we live really, really matters. It's not just about going to church one day a week. It's not about attending a meeting. Because of who we are, this extends to the entirety of our life. When you're on a vacation somewhere in a different part of the world, you wake up and you are still the temple of the Holy Ghost with the Holy Spirit residing in you. And your life in that moment is as dedicated to the worship and honor of God as it is as we sit here this morning. There's no time off. There's no getting away. It is who we are and we never leave. The Apostle Paul spends much of the New Testament trying to help educate people about their identity and how they should link their behavior and their lifestyle to who they are in Christ. 
He does this with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I don't think he's trying to beat them over the head, but I think as he's writing to a church full of Gentiles who didn't grow up in the Levitical system, who didn't grow up with an understanding of the Old Testament, he's trying to help them understand the seriousness of how they're living as God's holy people. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, he says this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. He could probably go on and continue to list all sorts of other sins. But what he is saying is those who do not know Christ, those who do not belong to Christ, they live this way. And they are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Their end is not going to be a good end. He then goes on to say in verse 11, And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He's saying they live that way because they don't know God. But it makes it really confusing when people who say they are the children of God live the same way as the people in the world who do not belong to God, whose end is not going to be good. They live that way because they don't know God. But you, holy child of God, you do know God. That God knows you and he has put his spirit in you. He says, but you are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He is trying to convince people that because we are his, how we live really, really matters. I want to come back into the passage. And like I said, so many of us have struggled with that. God, I want to live for you. God, I want you to be pleased with me. God, I want to bring honor to you. That's what I want. But sometimes I just don't know how. Paul is going to tell us a couple of things here about being a vessel of honor. He says this in verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified. And the first thing he says about this vessel of honor, this believer, this person who is living in a way that honors the Lord, he says, and meet for the master's use. In other words, you're useful to the master. He then goes on to say, and prepared unto every good work. Not only is he useful to the master, but he's ready to serve. He's ready to be used. It's not just this idea of God, I want you to do this for me someday. I want you to make me into this. It's God, I'm ready. I want to serve you. I'm prepared. I'm ready. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. Some of you today might be thinking, I don't feel very useful. And I know exactly what that feels like. Some of you today might be thinking, I love the sound of that, but I don't feel ready. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Comes back to the question I asked at the beginning. How do we go from God change me? God, I want to be useful to you to actually being used by the Lord. And I want to look at a couple of things here. Three steps. The first step in this process is first changing our thinking about who we are. Satan is going to try to discourage us. Satan is going to try to beat us up. Satan wants us to feel like a failure. Satan wants us to feel like we've already lost long before we ever began. But what does God say about us? We are the holy children of God. 
We're called royal priests in a holy nation in 1 Peter chapter 2. He tells us that we are the temple of the God, that we do have the very Spirit of God dwelling in us. If you go through the New Testament, there are so many titles that he gives to us as his church, as his bride. He showers us with love because of who we are in Jesus Christ. So going back and starting to change what God, our thinking on what God says to be true based on what I feel to be true, that's a first step. Bringing my thinking in line with an understanding of holiness. If this is who God says I am, then how I live my life actually really matters. And there may be things in my life that I can identify right now and I can say, I know that does not bring honor to God. And so changing our thinking to be in line with what God says to be true is the first step. Number two is to change the way that we think about growth. If you remember how I explained some of my pleadings to the Lord, it was, God, here I am, right? Make me into something different. God, will you change me? I don't like feeling like a failure. I don't want to be like this. Make me into something else. And yet the next day, I was still me. I didn't change. When we look into the word of God, change happens through synergism. Now that's a big fancy word and all it means this. <clears throat> it means cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It's not me standing over here saying, God, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to stay the same. I'm not going to make any effort, but just zap me with your power and make me different. Right? It's not that because that doesn't bring change. And it's not me on this side saying, you know what, I'm going to be different, so I'm going to do good works, I'm going to do these things, I'm going to mature, I'm going to grow in my own strength, and I'm going to become a different person. It's in the middle, where you're acknowledging, God, I'm weak, and I need your help. But I also clearly see in your word that there are things that you expect of me, that there are commands that there are things that you, ways that you want me to live as a believer. And so God, as weak as I am, I'm going to step out in faith and obedience and I am going to move forward in obeying you in that thing. But I desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit to help me do this. Because if it's just me on my own, I will fail every time. Yes, we have a responsibility to move forward in obedience. And the word of God tells us so many different things about how we are to live as believers. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes along and gives us the power and the strength and the ability and the help and everything we need to actually be able to do the things that God's asking us to do. God never stands back and says, believer, I want you to do this thing and it's impossible and you're going to fail. You're going to fail every time. No, God says, this is how I want you to live as my child. And I've given you everything that you could ever need to be successful and to move forward in that. It just takes me saying, okay, God, one step forward. I'm not going to be a totally different person tomorrow, but you know what? I can start living in obedience today and the next day and the next day. And at some point in the future, you will look back and see, wow, God, you have been changing me. So we need to change our thinking about who God says we are, being his holy people. We need to change our thinking about the process of growth. And the third step is to actually walk forward in obedience. Paul lays some things out in this passage. And just because of time, we're going to wrap this up in a minute or two. But he says this in verse 21. He says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. So Paul is telling us in verse 21 and 22 that there's certain things we need to do. One is to purge ourselves of these. Now the things that he's talking about, I believe, in the verses previous that we read, verse 16 talks about shunning profane and vain babblings. 
Verse 17 talks about these two characters, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who were teaching false doctrines, that they were getting people to follow after them. And it says that they have overthrown the faith of some. Some have said that the purging of these vessels is actually avoiding or, or being away from those people, having nothing to do with them. I don't know if that's so much the case. But I think there are things that God has clearly told us in his word that he wants us to have nothing to do with. That when it talks about these vain babblings, that I think there are times where we can get involved in things that cause dissension, that it's useless talk, that it doesn't benefit anybody. That we can get involved in conspiracy theories and gossip, tearing people down, false doctrines, talking about things that just don't matter, taking small doctrines and lifting them up to be greater than they were ever meant to be and beating people over the head with them. These things do not build up the body of Christ. In fact, they tear it down. And I believe Paul is saying, if you want to be a vessel into honor, it starts with purging, getting rid of, have nothing to do with those things over there. He then goes on to say, and flee also youthful lusts in verse 22. And he doesn't actually say specifically what those youthful lusts are. Some people have hypothesized and wrote lists about what these youthful lusts are. Probably, he's just talking about immaturity. Specifically in ways that contrast with what the rest of the verse says. Flee youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, and peace. So those youthful lusts are probably the opposite of those things that are actually going to bring growth, that are actually going to bring unity, that are actually the things that God wants us to pursue and the ways that God wants us to live as his children. And so anything in that category that's going to take away from righteousness and faithfulness and charity and peace, that's probably in that category of youthful lust that we need to flee. And so as God's holy people, there are things that we need to look at and say, okay, God, I want to be useful to you. I want to be ready to be used. What is there in my life that I need to purge? What is there in my life that I need to flee from that is not actually helping righteousness, faithfulness, charity, and peace grow within me as a believer? There are things that we have allowed ourselves to pursue, to love, to long after as believers that are the exact same things that the world pursues, loves, and longs after. And when we as the holy people of God go after those things, make those things priority, talk about those things, get other people to come with us to focus on those things, it is the same exact thing as bringing the common into the holy presence of God. Can you imagine what would have happened if a priest would have gone out and brought all the rubbish and all the filth and all the sickness outside and plopped it down in front of the presence of God? We hear that and we think, no, no, that would never happen. The Apostle Paul is wanting us to know that when we are not purging ourselves, that when we are not fleeing these things, that we are bringing the common and we are bringing it right into our hearts, right into our lives, who are the very temple of the Holy Ghost. He then not only says to flee and follow, but in verse 21 or 22, he says, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In this last minute, I just basically quickly I'm not going to define what righteousness and faithfulness and, and charity and peace are, but I want to point out specifically what he says. Follow these things with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. There's nowhere in the New Testament that gives this idea that if we want to grow or have some kind of relationship that's pleasing to God, we can have this relationship that's Jesus and me and nobody else that I don't need the church, that I can go off and live my Christian life on my own and not bother with the church. 
He is specifically commanding us here not only to flee youthful lusts, but he's saying, follow these things, righteousness, faith, charity, and peace. Follow them with them that call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Maturity and growth happens within the body of Christ. This is where we come and we receive teaching, challenge, encouragement, discipleship. We hear the word of God being taught. We get to worship together. And we are coming together with like-minded people who also want to grow and follow hard after righteousness, faith, charity, and peace. And when we're off on our own, we're actually off in the world. And that is never going to be a place to grow spiritually. The church offers so many opportunities to get together, to sing, to worship, to hear the word of God being taught, to come together and pray. Are we actually getting involved in those things? Because this is the way that the Lord has laid out for us to grow in spiritual maturity, to become useful and ready to be used by him. God has given us every single thing we need. We are limited by nothing. All he's asking us to do is agree with who he's made us to be. Everything he's given to us, everything he's provided. He wants us to worship him. He wants us to be in awe of him. He wants us to have fellowship and a relationship with him. And he's given everything needed. All we have to do is come alongside and say, Lord, I want that too. I want you. I want to worship you. I want my life to count. I want to be useful. I'm going to be ready to be used. And so what I see you telling me in your word, God, I am powerless in my own strength. I will fail every time. I desperately need your help. But I'm going to move forward in obedience. I need you to give me the strength to obey this. And that's the method, the solution, the how that Paul has laid out to those holy children of God who want to live according to who God has made them to be. There's not a lot of other solutions out there. There's no going off on our own and trying to figure out a new way. We are God's stuff to be used according to how God desires for his purposes for his worship and his honor. My encouragement, and I hope it's encouraging, you have been made holy by the God of the universe. That God has invited you to come into his presence, that he has invited you to have a relationship with him. And we don't even have to wear bells at the bottom of our garments and walk in fear. But that relationship comes with a responsibility to live in accordance with who God has made us to be. Thank you, Donnie, for the challenge of the word to our hearts this morning. We've all been in the presence of God we realize this morning who he is. Thank you all as Christians today name of the name of the Lord want to be a vassal unto honor. Don't they? Because outside there, God needs us. But God wants his best. And I trust that you will help us today through the word to, to grow in him. Let's plan a word of prayer as we part this morning. Our Father, we have certainly felt your presence uh, today in this place. And you've been here. And Lord, there's only two. There's a vessel of honour or a vessel of dishonour. And Lord, Lord, you know all our lives and you know that the, the holiness of God and the perfection of God and the things you want in our lives and the things you don't want in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that this will be a help to someone this morning. Lord, to leave behind the common to go after the things of holiness for the day that we live. Bless each believer in this place this morning. I pray, Lord, that they will be the channel. They will be the vessel in their home, in their work, 
wherever they are, at Lonar Golf. Cover each one of us with the precious blood until you come again, which could be soon. I pray, Lord, we'll be willing to be changed for you. In Jesus' name, cover us with the blood, part us with your blessing this morning. In Jesus' precious name, we ask it. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning.